welcome to everybody who is here, and particularly, of course, to Professor Richard Sherwin, who I am as ignorant about his work as many of you in the room, because as I've been explaining to him, those of us who've been teaching law in Cambridge for many years often do it in a very boring way, and we don't know anything about these new interesting ways of thinking about law, and we are going to be, um, I think, instructive. The audience, you're a really interesting cross-section of people, I think, from undergraduates to postgraduates to academics to all sorts of people I don't even recognise. So at the end, when we get into questions, discussion, it may well be useful if you're happy enough to say who you are, because Richard is very interested in knowing who you are when you respond to what he's going to say. I'm not going to introduce him in any detail, except to say that he's here because of Shubha Mukherjee, who has a very interesting project going at the moment, which is interdisciplinary in a really interesting way, and it's crossroads of knowledge in the early modern something there. <laughs> Do you know what the project is? Yes. Well. <laughs> uh, and it's interdisciplinary, and Richard is here talking, interdisciplinary professor with people within the English faculty, and um, again, I don't think we do as much of that as we should. You know, it's quite exciting for people on the law faculty to talk to the Institute of Criminology, let alone the English faculty. So anything we can do to break down some of our barriers. Um, Visualising Law is one of your books, and you might tell us a bit more about that later. Professor Sherwin, as you know from the blurb, is Wallace Stevens Professor of Law and Dean for Faculty Scholarship, Director of the Visual Persuasion Project at New York Law School, and I'm going to sit down <laughs> and you're going to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nikki. Thanks for uh, the invitation to come uh, speak to you. Uh, I, it's wonderful to be here in, in Cambridge. Uh, I consider this place a kind of uh, intellectual oasis. Uh, and uh, in these uh, challenging times, that's no small thing. Uh, this approach that uh, I'm bringing uh, to my teaching actually is rather marginal in the States as well, uh, but not in practice. Uh, the the uh, premise of, of my talk is that uh, the way law today is being practiced in the courtroom and in law offices uh, has been transformed by new forms of visual technology. And uh, what that means essentially is that words are giving the stage of law uh, a, a, new, um, a, a new kind of uh, 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 context, the, the meaning of uh, uh, images, the way images convey uh, different kinds of uh, uh, expressions of, uh, uh, sorry, I'm losing my thought. Um, uh, let me start with this. The, the idea of the adversarial context in which law pursues truth as a kind of, uh, shall we say, a, 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 a cauldron of opposing narratives uh, is something that hasn't really been explored in the context of visual images. How does the truth-testing uh, methodology that we've inherited in the Anglo-American uh, tradition, uh, how does it operate when we shift uh, from the traditional uh, uh, word-based mode of communication to screens. Uh, this really uh, hasn't been studied in law school. It's just beginning to be written about, but it raises a lot of really interesting questions. Um, for example, when you think about visual evidence or watching uh, images as the basis of truth, in the search for truth in a given case. What exactly are we looking at when you think about it? Uh, when one watches an evidentiary image, uh, who exactly is 
testifying? Uh, is it the person or the object or the scene that's being depicted? Is it the, the image or the image maker who frames what we see? Is it the uh, digital program that is used in post-production to uh, frame the image? Uh, what, what does it mean to cross-examine an image in court? Uh, so these are not simple matters, and in fact, over the years, I've found that the more one considers the issues involved, uh, the trickier it becomes. So I want to advocate today in favor of training jurists uh, to become more visually literate uh, so that the uh, adversarial tradition may flourish under new technological conditions. And to attain that uh, in the face of these changing visual technologies, I think we have to realize what is at stake. We need to learn new methods of inquiry, new forms of knowledge, new aesthetic codes, so that the integrity of the truth-seeking process may be preserved. The thing that I'm going to talk about today has to do with what happens when images migrate to the screen. What we note is that images live on the screen uh, the way uh, uh, other images do in various cultural contexts. And that means, essentially, that uh, the logic of visual association and affective engagement have now become part and parcel of the legal reasoning process. And I'm, uh, in law school, uh, the word-based uh, epistemology of law is linear and logical. The syllogism is a main tool. But images do not function that way. They don't function as propositions. They function in the way of visual association. Uh, conjuring associated images and memories uh, that are saturated with affect. So the question is, how do we know uh, how to assess the impact of these kinds of um, new forms of visual communication in the truth-seeking process? How do we know, for example, when affect has become more prejudicial than probative in a given case? Uh, how do we speak about this as legal advocates? Uh, in, in my seminar on uh, visual persuasion, I believe I would deem it a success if my students knew how to stand up and say, I object to red, Your Honor. I object to red. Why? What is it about this particular uh, focus, uh, a crime scene, a pool of blood dwelling somewhere? Is it more prejudicial than probative? Uh, what, what is it conjuring? Uh, so these are the kinds of things, the kinds of questions and controversies uh, that I want to engage. And um, I think the place to begin is with storytelling. That's another thing that uh, I never really learned much about in law school, although when I became a uh, prosecutor in New York, I rapidly realized that the more I lectured the, the jurors about rules, um, the less uh, contact uh, I, I made. And that, as studies have shown, uh, jurors tend to construct meaning with narrative. Facts are made to cohere on the basis of the stories that are told in court. And the best lawyers that I've uh, seen in court are the ones who know which particular story type is optimal for a particular case. Uh, so for example, prosecutors are rather fond of telling whodunit stories, adding up clues uh, that solve the mystery uh, of the crime uh, in, a, in a criminal case. Well, here's, here's an example of uh, a visual version of a whodunit uh, that's taken from uh, prosecutors, Marsha Clark's uh, summation in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial in 1984. We have the Rockingham blood trail. We have the Rockingham gloves. With all of the evidence on it, 
Ron Goldman fibers from his shirt, Ron Goldman's hair, Nicole's hair, the defendant's blood, Ron Goldman's blood, Nicole's blood. There he is. There he is. So this is the, uh, the, the you know, the, the visual equivalent of, of uh, solving a mystery. The puzzles snap into place, each puzzle piece, uh, a, a clue, uh, a bit of evidence that's been submitted in the course of the trial and you have the mystery solved in the end. Here's another one, uh, a graphic I'm rather fond of that was created by Christopher Ritter. Uh, very simple, very expensive, uh, and very interesting. I'd, I'd ask you, I'm gonna play this, and I'd ask you to tell me what genre do you think uh, is being exploited? What narrative genre is being exploited uh, in this, uh, with this visual. Uh, it was used in the Timothy McVeigh uh, murder trial in 1997. This was a terrorist, domestic terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, the Federal Murrah building was, was uh, bombed. Hundreds of people died. Um, and the graphic is just this clock face and an audio an audio of a uh, very boring administrative law meeting that was taking place at exactly the time of the blast. And it's important to know as you look at this that the explosion on April 19th, 1995 occurred at precisely 9.02 a.m. So let's see if you can identify uh, the narrative genre uh, this is using. Basically what happens is uh, we'll present evidence here, evidence from the applicants, ask questions, hear from the protestants with regard to why the application shouldn't be granted. And uh, I take all of that information under advisement and draft up what's called a uh, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and a proposed order, which will be mailed to all the parties about 15 days before the Oklahoma Water Resources Board meet. They actually, uh, they sit in this room and discuss the application and vote whether to approve or deny the application. So they're the decision makers. And you'll receive a, a copy of my proposed recommendation and can attend that board meeting and uh, present your information directly to them or arguments directly to the nine member board. Uh, they generally meet the second Tuesday of every month. So you'll be advised of that. Uh, with regard to this proceeding, basically there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding. Uh, What do you think? Is, is there a recognizable genre here? Why the second hand? Why, what's the importance of having that second hand going around that clock face? Suspense. Precisely. Suspense. Why suspense? Why, why, what is, what, what's the utility or the power of that narrative genre in this context? Why suspense? It makes it a story. It is a story. But what is it doing? What's its function? It fills you with dread. Dread. Why does it fill you with dread? Well, that's what suspense is for. And, and, and how do we know that? When we talk about suspense, it's like, who's the master of suspense? Alfred Hitchcock. And what, what does Alfred Hitchcock do in his films? The guy with the knife is already in the shower. But the victim, the woman who's preparing to use the shower, doesn't see him. But we see him. The audience sees him. The, everyone but the victim knows what is going to happen, what is inevitable. And the exquisite suspension 
of that end point, which must come, is the intensification of hot. That's what suspense does. It's an, it's an intensifier of emotion. What has, uh, what we are looking at in this tape has already happened. Everyone knows it has to happen. It's th the future perfect. There is no escaping it. And so the anticipation is precisely what is being used to magnify that, that emotional intensity. Uh, anticipatory horror. No one objects to this. No one is even registering what is going on. There is no intellectual analysis for this kind of thing when it's shown in court. It just unfolds. Part of my point here is to say, if this is an adversarial contest in the search for truth, where's the contest? When screens go on, lawyers tend to sit down and watch. What happened to that truth safeguarding function? Here's a famous example, an early one, maybe one of the first videos I saw, where George Holliday bought a new video recorder in 1991 and walked onto his terrace and turned it on and by sheer happenstance recorded four Los Angeles police officers beating motorist Rodney King. They had just chased him on the highway, stopped him, and they were furiously beating him. And this videotape became the centerpiece of the state's assault case against the four officers. This was highly publicized. There's a tremendous sense of public outrage about excessive force. What the defense for the officers did was digitize the analog video, which gave them tremendous power over the frame-by-frame -frame sequencing of the images. And that what they, in fact, did was choreograph the sequence of images to suit the narrative that the defense wanted to tell. And what was that narrative? These are professionals. What's their job? They understand the escalation and de-escalation of force. They know how to respond to circumstances that require violence sometimes. And they were professionals. They did exactly what they were trained to do. So in the digital version, and I'll show you this, and first you'll see the analog, and then, you'll, then it'll switch to the, to the defense digital version. What the defense managed to do was to tell a completely different story that was based on the construction of causation. You ever read David Hume about the causation? That, that causation is like a fiction, what the eye creates in the close juxtaposition of two events. It was a famous uh, uh, psych experiment at Harvard in the 50s where uh, people sat down in front of a screen, an old oscilloscope screen, and they saw two balls coming together on the screen and one moving away. And when asked, what did you see? They said, there was a collision and one caused the other to move off to the right. Causation was a construct. So what the digital version of the images constructed was a narrative that said every time Rodney King obeyed police orders to lie prone, to lie prone on the ground, the batons were up in the air. But when he raised up on his haunches in resistance to the police authority, the batons came down. And this is what you'll see. He goes down, the batons go up. He comes up, the batons go down. The construction of causation, which might explain why many of the juries who acquitted the police officers in this case, told the press, Rodney King was in charge of the situation. He caused the police to be there. The construction of causation. Here's what it looked like. The regular version. The 
defense. The police are afraid. You watch the original version and the defense is the police are afraid. He's not going into compliance mode. He's rising up. And this story was compelling to the jurors. So let's switch to other ways in which visuals are used these days in court. Today, everyday events which might otherwise escape documentation are being captured on a variety of uh, different recording devices, police surveillance cameras, dashboard mounted cameras in, in patrol cars. Uh, the re there's a movement now to use remote mini cameras worn by police officers. Uh, smartphones, there's been a spate of police shootings across uh, the United States that have been captured on uh, smartphone devices, videotape, because everyone has a camera in their pocket now. Consider this smartphone video that flatly contradicted a police report by the re arresting officer who claimed that a bicyclist drove directly into the officer and he was being uh, 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 charged with assaulting an officer. But this is what the smartphone showed. The cyclist was one of dozens rolling through Times Square. The video shows the officer in the middle of the street, and what happens next appears hostile and unprovoked, as the cyclist is shot to the ground for no obvious reason. In a word, witnesses were stuck. They were looking, looking, and all of a sudden the one put up his arms and like body checked this kid off his bicycle. I mean, so hard that the kid actually left the lane and onto the sidewalk. But minutes later, it's the cyclist who's arrested, charged with attempted assault, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct. The officer is assigned to the Midtown South Precinct and is identified tonight as Patrick Poe, a rookie with barely six months on the NYPD, who insisted that the cyclist tried to run him over. The defendant steered the defendant's bicycle in the direction of Officer Poe and drove the defendant's bicycle directly into his body, causing the officer to suffer lacerations on his forearms, end quote. But watched in slow motion, the video seems to contradict that. <laughs> the NYPD and critical mass protesters have been at odds for years. Hundreds were arrested for stopping traffic at the Republican convention here in 2004, and monthly demonstrations have continued ever since, with police insisting it's a disruption and a danger, and cyclists insisting it's their right. And if they don't fall along the traffic, they should be ticketed. But that doesn't mean they should be pushed off their bicycle and slammed onto the curb. The officer has been placed tonight on modified assignment. That means he has been stripped of his gun and his badge, and yes, he is off the street tonight. The cyclist is identified as 29-year-old Christopher Long of Hoboken, in New Jersey, who was not seriously injured, although he could have been. His lawyer refused to comment, saying the video. Speak. Okay, so... This is a bicyclist when the stakes involve shooting uh, someone who's accused of a crime. Obviously, the stakes are, are much higher. This has lately caused a uh, movement toward more and more use of uh, police uh, uh, mini cans, both worn and on police cars, which it is hoped will make it more difficult to file false police claims. Although I've been reading lately, increasingly the police are adapting their behavior to the vi visual medium and narrating what is going on as they're doing it. Stop pushing me. Let go of that knife, which uh, may or may not exist. They are creating the narrative 
knowing they're being filled. And some have said, which is the theme that I love, this is the um, uh, life imitating art theme, that they've assumed the performance of well-known uh, figures in various police dramas. They perform themselves as police officers uh, uh, in order to uh, gain control of the visual narrative. Uh, so it's always a, a question of ad adaptation. Here's another thing I've, I've lately been seeing more of, crime uh, reenactments where you go to the scene of the crime and there's a, uh, a walkthrough and a, a reenactment, uh, a video reconstruction. Uh, we saw this uh, fairly recently in uh, 2012. George Zimmerman uh, possessed a handgun. He was wor working as a volunteer security guard uh, in Florida in a gated community allegedly not especially friendly to outsiders. In this, this case, the victim was black, and there's a, a, lot, uh, a lot of racial overtones to this story. Uh, and Zimmerman uh, shot Trayvon Martin and killed him. Uh, it's not clear what the circumstances were, who was the aggressor. And the uh, scene was recreated a day or two after the shooting took place. Now, I ask you to watch this and think, what is a jury seeing when they look at a reconstruction like this, when they look at someone like Zimmerman calmly and politely interacting with police officers at the scene of the crime, uh, calmly talking through, giving essentially his version, his partial version of the story, the defense in effect. Uh, and the, the police are obviously not um, uh, challenging him, nor is the prosecution uh, challenging this reconstruction. Can you hear? He's very calm, he seems very contrite, he seems not aggressive in any way. And, and the question is, what are we watching here? What kind of a performance is this? Who, who is Zimmerman playing in this scene? And when this is played in court, what's the proper response to it? How do we cross-examine what we see here? Is it even being decoded sufficiently for it to warrant some kind of confrontation in court? Here's another dimension to the notion of crime or accident reconstructions. Digital animation, simulations, based upon testimony and physical evidence that are used to picture what had presumably taken place. Uh, this is um, sometimes used as demonstrative evidence to help a jury understand a witness's testimony, and sometimes it's used in uh, an attorney's summation. The, in this instance, in the Zimmerman case, uh, it was played in uh, the uh, defense's uh, uh, closing argument. These are digital 
simulations of what must have occurred, so argues the defense, based upon testimony heard in court, together with uh, physical evidence like 911 audios uh, and other evidence taken together. Now, because it's based upon testimony, it builds upon evidence that includes a lot of assumptions or inferences. It can only be as good as what it is uh, drawing its evidentiary claims from, and it tends to fill in gaps uh, in its representation. Uh, take a look. TU section. The first, there's a shot to the nose, we contend. Number one right there is where the flashlight is found. George's small flashlight is key. We didn't have any movement except to get them to the spot of the event we're shooting because we don't really know what happened. Although George did, George Zimmerman did say that he tried to push him off and tried to push him away. I think in the video they were moving like, the third position is when John Good, as he was leaving, said that they sort of come down the way a little. He looked hurt. I can't see him. I want to go up there. I don't know what's going on. So it's almost like a soundtrack. The 911 tape is almost like a soundtrack that the digital simulation is tracking, uh, illustrating it, or so that that's the claim. Uh, what was the exact position of Trayvon as he straddled Zimmerman? How did he punch him? How did he hit his head against the pavement? No one knows with any great certainty, certainly not with any great detail, and yet these images would have you believe that this is what it looked like, so that we slip into the mentality of a kind of documentary film rather than the testimonial version of the truth, which uh, then carries with it all of the authority of the documentary genre. That's what's being elicited. Uh, how are these things cross-examined? How are these things uh, um, worked through? How are they challenged is my, is my question. Now, it's true also that animation is very powerful and it allows us to learn things we might not otherwise be privy to. We can uh, go places you couldn't ordinarily go, like uh, inside uh, technical equipment uh, and take a look at m microscopic uh, elements in a computer, let's say, and see exactly what it is that's uh, contested. Uh, or you can go inside the body and, and uh, see whether or not the claim uh, that plaque was accumulating in an artery requiring some kind of bypass surgery. You can look at these things and understand the procedure uh, in a way that words might not allow. This is a great strength of this technology. But then you have other things, like in, I don't know if you ever look at neuroscience journals. Neuroscience journals love um, illustrations. Uh, there's a large um, uh, use of functional magnetic imaging, uh, fMRIs, which um, uh, uh, are very dramatic, like this um, brain this brain lighting up, shall we say. What do you mean, this brain lighting up? It's not a brain. I mean, an fMRI is not a picture of a brain. It's not an x-ray. I don't think juries really understand what it is that they're, they're looking at. It's an fMRI image is essentially uh, an, an algorithm that takes a, a general uh, statistics uh, of blood flow from a, some normal population and then compares it to the blood flow in a particular individual and then um, draws certain inferences from that. Uh, and the algorithm uh, constructs something that looks like a brain. 
But of course, brains don't light up in nature. They don't turn red and blue. And the algorithm decides what's red and what's blue. I object to red, Your Honor. Maybe that ought to be said in some of these situations. Uh, this is known as the Christmas tree effect, uh, that people are drawn to the drama of, of these luminous fMRI images. The other thing that animations can do, digital animations, uh, is that they can combine different media and, as a result, uh, extract credibility from multiple sources. And, and it's a kind of bootstrapping operation where the more credible sources bolster the less credible sources. So I'll, I'll give you an example of this. This is an animation <laughs> that was made um, uh, about the forced landing of a US Airways flight that actually landed on the Hudson River, just off Midtown Manhattan, on January 15th, 2009. The pilot reported uh, double uh, uh, engine failure when a flock of geese inadvertently collided with the plane and uh, caused the engines to stall. Of course, no one saw that collision, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be digitally reconstructed. And note all the elements that are in play here. Oops. Cactus 15.9, first grade of contact, I'm using 15.9. Cactus 15.9, from us, I'm using 270. Yeah, this is uh, Cactus 15.39, it burns to your phone, so I'm going to pop in and back towards the wire. Okay, uh, you need to return a little body. Turn left heading up, uh, 220. 220. Stop you to pause your center emergency returning. This is 15.9. He uh, bird strike, he lost all engines, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. 15.9, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Practice 15.9, we can get it to you. Do you want to try to lay in 1913? 191, we're in the process. Hi, Practice 15.9, could be left traffic to runway 31. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, we're going to park Guy Mercy in back. Hey, guys. Cactus 15.9 will be George Washington Bridge. Wants to go to the airport right now. Oh, so, Eric, I'll check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for, uh, runway one? Runway one, that's good. Cactus 15.9, turn right 280. If you land right at one at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus 15.9, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up to 2 o'clock in about 7 months. Eagle Pie 2718, turn left thing 210. 210, uh, I think he said he's going to the Hudson. <laughs> Cactus 15.9, uh, Eagle So this is an impressive piece of work when you think about it. Uh, some of the metrics that are incorporated into this visual are docu well documented. Uh, the, the, the audio with the uh, flight tower is real. This is occurring presumably in real time. We can map out exactly where the plane was in altitude uh, or, and in, in space at a given moment. Uh, all of this is, seems to be a fairly credible metric, and then we have the geese, and then we have uh, the people who are out on the wing of the plane. And did you notice how it fades into a photograph at the end, as if to say we can retroactively project photorealism into everything that preceded that moment? That's how realistic it all is, because it, it is a photograph. Of course, it's not. It's a digital simulation that closed in on the photograph they used at the end. So what's the effect of the credibility of some of the elements in that visual, sort of bootstrapping the fictive quality of other elements? And who is actually astute enough to make the overall assessment of what's persuading them as they watch? 
There, there are interesting implications to this, and, and sometimes I worry about them. Uh, it, it makes you wonder what you're looking at sometimes. I had that feeling uh, recently when I watched uh, a visual that was uh, given to the news media by the Egyptian government. Egyptian officials claimed that it was an infrared video of armed protesters shooting at the police. And if that's accurate, that would be the kind of provocation uh, that could justify the Egyptian security force fatally shooting over 200 supporters of the deposed Muslim uh, Brotherhood President Mohammed Mercy. But is this a video really, uh, or is it something else? It looks to me more like a, a TV station video the game. has shown this infrared footage, which the authorities say shows Brotherhood gunmen firing on police as they entered one camp to clear protesters. I don't know. It, it, it makes me think, I, I, you know, this blurring of the line between reality and digital simulation uh, led me to come up with this phrase, the digital Baroque. Uh, the, the recent book that I wrote explores the implications of this, this funny confusion between what's real and what's not real. We see this a lot in contemporary culture, the matrix effect where, uh, you know, the, you ever see the Wachowski's uh, Matrix series? Uh, we're living in a video game, essentially, a digital simulation to refresh your like, recollection. What you can smell, you can taste, and see that real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You've been living in the dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. So, you know, we have this, this sense, I, I, I call it a sense of metaphysical anxiety, that these, these pop cultural films, uh, which we see a good deal of today, play out this theme. Do we really know what reality is? This is the Baroque theme of dreams within dreams. We don't really uh, know what we're waking up to. It's all a Borges-like uh, entangled um, series of uh, dream worlds. There's another thing that um, we have to really think hard about, and, and this has to do with the affective component that I talk about with um, um, when images um, are uh, playing in court. Uh, for example, something called a victim impact statement. Uh, this, this is the offshoot of a Supreme Court decision, Payne v. Tennessee, 1991. The Supreme Court said that uh, in homicide cases, it was constitutionally permissible for the state to offer what, what it called a quick glimpse into the decedent's life in order to show decision makers what was lost, what the loss of, of this individual meant to family members and friends and maybe to, to society. But what exactly the court meant by a quick glimpse uh, has never really been uh, clarified. It's, 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 it's kind of been uh, interpreted broadly, and uh, this is a, certainly the case when it comes to these victim impact videos uh, that try to convey the worth of a life. So here's an example of one from a case, uh, Kelly v. California, in which the state, uh, the, the judge in this homicide case, allowed prosecutors in the sentencing phase of the trial to, to submit an 18 and a half minute video that was essentially uh, a documentary, a mini documentary about the victim's life, starting with baby pictures on through her 18th birthday celebration, the year she was killed, with the mother narrating. Okay? Uh, and not only was the mother narrating this, but they had uh, a soundtrack. You know, the 
Canadian music artist Enya. Well, you'll, I'll play this for you. you you'll, you'll, you'll hear Enya. One of the things that were argued on appeal, this went all the way up to the Supreme Court of California, said Enya is prejudicial. <laughs> <laughs> and you, 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 you have to scratch your head when you read his opinions. And the court said, no, Enya is not unduly prejudicial. Uh, if it was Celine Dior, they said, maybe that would be different. Oh, why? Uh, it, it, it's also curious how no objections were made when the homicide victim is seen riding off into the Canadian Rockies at the end on horseback. She's Native American. Into her ancestral homeland. What? Where did that come from? That's somebody's fantasy. And yet it was uh, admitted. Here's what it looked like. I'm going to just shoot through this. It's too long. Enya. is riding off. And I, I just had this, this, this curious feeling about when the court actually talks about Celine Dior, you know, and what would it look like if it had used uh, Celine Dion? It would sound like this. Right? Could have. So that's unduly prejudicial according to the court. Well, is that because Maybe it would remind juries of the soundtrack from the Titanic, and they might make the emotional association from the song. That's, that's precisely what you want to do. You want to import the kinds of emotional associations or memories that are unconsciously uh, uh, undertaken by simply listening. This is an invisible kind of a thing, hard to elicit and hard to attack because it's implicit. Here's a, this is my last illustration. And it's, um, it points to this kind of thing at a more sophisticated level. Uh, I'm curious to hear what you think about this. Um, because I, I think maybe this is a new form of visual eloquence, and we shouldn't really worry about it as long as somebody is smart enough to contest it on its own terms. <laughs> but this is an example, again, of multimedia coming into play. Multiple sources playing out at the same time. This is a, uh, uh, a murder trial uh, uh, that uh, it was very difficult to prosecute. Um, it, it, the murder occurred in 1975. Martha Moxley was murdered. Um, Michael Skakel, a cousin to the Kennedy family, was accused of the murder. And what the prosecution did in their summation was to integrate images from the crime scene, which was 1975, a recording that for some reason uh, Skakel made as a kind of a boarded uh, autobiography, but they got the, uh, uh, the audio uh, as part of the uh, discovery process. And they played that in the trial, at the trial in the courtroom in, 19, in 2002. So we have this vast discrepancy in the time periods of all these different things that are playing together. But the digital inter intermediation of all of these uh, sources creates a kind of collapse of time, as if it's all happening in the now time of the courtroom, which kind of makes me think of a sort of a strange Proustian 
moment almost where you have this uh, uh, sudden gestalt that it's all taking place at the same time. Um, and I want you to look at this and pay attention, if you will, to the juxtaposition between certain images and the words that are uttered um, by uh, Skakel, uh, because the montage is telling you why he is saying uh, these words, as if perhaps you're actually in his head, understanding his own motivation. Take a look. And then I woke up, went to sleep, and I woke up to Mrs. Moxley saying, Michael, has, have you seen Martha? I'm like, what? And I was like, still hot from the night before, a little drunk from the night. I was like, what? I was like, oh my God, did they see me last night? And I'm like, I don't know. So I'm like, and I remember just having a feeling of panic. Like, oh shit. You know, like my worry of what I went to bed with. Like maybe, I don't know. You know what I mean? Just had, I had a feeling of panic. Panic. I had a feeling of panic. And you know, every time he says the word panic, Martha Moxley's mutilated figure is suddenly shown inside this, this box in court as if to say that's what he was thinking of when he, he said he was experiencing panic. He was thinking, he was experiencing panic because the image of his victim came to his mind. Well, how, wait, how can we know that he was thinking of Martha Moxley when he uttered, uttered the word panic? I mean, this is, how, how can you get inside someone's mind in this way? And yet the, the communication is operating, the, the argument that this is what explains his use of the word panic operates on a fairly subliminal level. And it's an unconscious visual association. And that's my concern. That's what I'm trying to convey to you. Uh, are these kinds of techniques of association properly recognized for the work that they're, they're doing? Um, is it being properly cross-examined. How can you know this? Is it being deconstructed for the jury so that they understand what exactly is being done, the manipulation of the elements that the state is attempting to perform in court? So here's my, my summary uh, that shifts in the media, shifts in visual technology result in shifts in Epistemology and aesthetics, different aesthetic registers operate, different forms of knowledge. And uh, we're moving away from words as a kind of propositional assertion to, to something that's associative and effective. Uh, so it, we're awash in images everywhere we look, but as part of this visual turn in the, in the digital uh, simulation part in, in particular, which gives us the power to represent almost anything we can imagine, uh, this, this tremendous control, it carries a certain anxiety. What are we looking at? Is it real? What's the difference between uh, the geese and the people on the wing of the plane? How can we be certain? What's real? What's illusion? Um, this, this metaphysical anxiety uh, has to be addressed. So. What I argue is that if we're going to judge images, we have to understand what aesthetic register, what epistemology those images are operating in. We have to know if we're testing a metric, like whether the plane really was at that altitude. That's one form of objective assessment. Or are we dealing with something more like an emotional performance? Is the affect overstated? Is it distorted? Is it based upon an impermissible association which would make it unduly prejudicial? This is what I mean by literacy, knowing what the image is doing, what register it's operating in, and how are we going to contest it in the grand tradition of the adversarial truth-testing process. If we can't identify it, if we can't describe it, if we can't understand its prejudicial aspect, 
then we can't achieve the truth testing process that has preserved uh, the search for truth in, in this long common law uh, tradition. So uh, that's why I argue that visual literacy is, is, is absolutely necessary to preserve that tradition. Um, we need to know how to assess both aesthetically and also in terms of the knowledge base that's being claimed so that our judgments are reliable. That's what I write about in uh, Visualizing Law in the Age of Digital Baroque. And if you want to see a, a, a many more examples of how images are being used in the courtroom, you can Google Visual Persuasion, my website. The Visual Persuasion Project re website will come up and you can uh, see more of these kinds of illustrative uh, visuals. Thank you.